Hello and welcome to Travel Smart Seniors, and this time we're going to take a look at five great sites in the capital of the Czech Republic, and that is Prague. We're going to take a look at the Old Town Square, the Jewish Quarter, Castle Hill, the Charles Bridge, and finally end up on Wenceslas Square. I will put chapter markers in the video so that you can jump to whatever part of the video you want to see. Prague is the capital of the Czech Republic and it's surrounded by Germany, Austria, Slovakia, and Poland. We'll begin our visit at Prague's Old Town Square and it's one of the most famous and historically significant public squares in Europe. It is the site of the world famous astronomical clock and we'll see that later. This is a memorial to Jan Hus, a religious reformer who challenged the Catholic Church's authority and was burned at the stake as a heretic in 1415. As we look around the square, we see the very diverse architecture, including Romanesque, Baroque, and Renaissance. This is the Church of Our Lady before Tin, and notice the spires, they're asymmetrical. The right one is larger than the left one. Next, we see the Gothic Tower that houses the astronomical clock, which is a very popular spot. There's a large observation deck at the top of the tower, which gives you marvelous views of the city. And the good news is, is there's even an elevator, so you don't have to take the stairs. Also, at the base of the tower is the astronomical clock, and just to the left is the tourist office. More about the clock in a minute. Next, we see the St. Nicholas Church, which is alongside the Pariska Street, the elegant shopping street in Prague. We finish our aerial tour with a look at the Dali, Mucha, and Andy Warhol Gallery, which I will cover later. All right, so we're back at ground level looking at the Jan Hus Memorial. His teachings sparked the Hussite Wars in the early 15th century. As we look around the square, you can see architecture of different types, Gothic, Baroque, and Renaissance. And the square has been here for a while. It originated in the 12th century. This is the early Baroque Marian column, which was built as a thank you to the Virgin Mary for defending Prague against Swedish troops in 1648. Now it's time to head down the square to the astrological clock, which was completed in 1410, making it the third oldest in the world, but now is the oldest still operating. And it is the number one tourist attraction in the square for both pigeons and people. We were actually quite surprised at the crowds because this was mid-September and we thought the season was over. The clock chimes every hour on the hour from 9 a.m. until 11 p.m. And the work itself is just an absolute masterpiece. Above the clock, the windows slide open, revealing the parade of the Twelve Apostles, each turning to face the crowd. And finally, at the top of the hour, the windows close and the cock crows. <laughs> the amount of information you can get from the upper dial is just absolutely astounding. Not only does it give you the date and time and zodiac sign, it gives you such things as the mean revolutions of the moon, sunrise, sunset, and even ancient check time. Below the clock is another disc which shows the months of the year, and more importantly, it shows the saint corresponding to each day of the year. So now we're going to go across the square to the church of Our Lady before Tin. Tin was a courtyard in front of the church, and it's not entirely obvious how to get to the church itself. Buildings are in front of it, but there's a little alley on the left side of the church that will take you to the church. The church was built in the 14th century, although the origins date back even earlier. The church is adorned with Gothic altars, a Baroque pulpit, and a very impressive organ. The organ dates back to 1673, and the organ's case is a masterpiece of Baroque craftsmanship. I found that the wood carvings in here were very, very impressive, like this side chapel. This particular wood carving marks the gravestone of Tycho Brahe, the Danish astronomer who moved here in 1599. 
While he was here in Prague, he collaborated closely with the German mathematician and astronomer Johannes Kepler. All right, back through the alley and out into the square, and we turn to right in front of the church, which is the gallery of Dali, Mucha, and Warhol. As far as I can tell, Salvador Dali did not have any connections with Prague, but many of his works, especially sculptures, are displayed here. Alfonso Mucha is in fact a Czech artist, and his Art Nouveau display is wonderful, including this poster of Sarah Bernhardt. For me, this was the most interesting part of the exhibition. It's the story of how Andrew Warhola became Andy Warhol because his parents were immigrants from Czechoslovakia and when they went to Pittsburgh. And there's iconic posters and pictures done by Andy Warhol in the museum itself. Back outside, we cross over to the other corner of the square where the expensive shopping street is and take a look at St. Nicholas Church. The St. Nicholas Church is a masterpiece of Baroque architecture, and it was built in the early 18th century. Many of the paintings, and especially the altar, depict the life and times of St. Nicholas. This organ was played by Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart during his stay in Prague. All right, that takes care of the central square. Now it's time to turn our attention to the Jewish quarter. The Jewish Quarter is right down Pariska Street, the luxury shopping street, and we're going to go to the Starnova Synagogue, which is the oldest active synagogue in Europe. The Jewish Quarter is called Yosefhof, and it's named after Emperor Joseph II, whose reforms improved the conditions for Jews in Prague. Historically, the area was a ghetto, but it's developed into a vibrant center of Jewish culture and religion. It is a very popular tourist destination, and the quarter is associated with Franz Kafka, who has a statue dedicated to him near his childhood home. We start our tour at the Star Nova Synagogue, which is actually the old new synagogue. It was built around 1270 and is the oldest surviving synagogue in Europe that still serves its original purpose. You get a good sense of the age of the synagogue when you enter it and see the rather austere, very thick stone walls and arches. The bima, or platform, is located in the center and it's surrounded by an iron grill, and the Torah Ark is positioned along the eastern wall. The arch ceilings are absolutely gorgeous, and this is really a must-visit place to get a sense of Jewish history in Prague. Next, it's just a short walk to the ceremonial hall of the Prague Jewish Burial Society. It doesn't serve its original function anymore, but it has been preserved as a historical and cultural site. So it has a lot of exhibitions related to Jewish burial customs, the history, and the broader history of the community in Prague. You can see the adjoining Jewish cemetery out of one of the windows, and I highly recommend you get some information about the Jewish burial process before going into the cemetery. So let's go into the old Jewish cemetery and walk around a little bit. The cemetery is one of the largest Jewish cemeteries in the world, and it was established in the 15th century, the early 15th century. And because of limited space, the cemetery became overcrowded and the bodies were often buried in layers with as many as 12 layers in some areas. This practice gives the cemetery its distinctive appearance with densely packed, uneven rows of gravestones. There are about 12,000 visible tombstones, although the number of burials, of course, is much higher. The cemetery is the final resting place of several famous Jewish figures, including Franz Kafka. The gravestones are made of sandstone or limestone and have symbolic carvings such as lions, deers, and hands representing the deceased name, tribe, or profession. Over time, many of these gravestones have become weathered and tilted, which adds to the cemetery's unique, very haunting atmosphere. Notes containing personal messages, prayers, memories of the deceased, and the stones is its symbol of charity and reminder of the deceased person's good deeds. Placing the stone is seen as a mitzvah and is believed to bring blessings to the soul of the departed. Head just outside of the cemetery and go over to the Pincus Synagogue. 
This synagogue is very moving. After World War II, it was transformed into a memorial dedicated to the victims of the Holocaust. Inside, the interior walls are inscribed with the names of these victims, 80,000 of them, along with their dates of birth and death. The names are organized by the victims' hometowns and regions. This creates a powerful and personal connection for visitors, especially those who may be searching for the names of a lost relative. If you don't do anything else in the Jewish quarter, you should visit this synagogue and then go to the cemetery. After this very moving visit, we stop very quickly at the Meisel Synagogue, which has been converted into a museum, part of the Jewish Museum here in Prague. This museum focuses more on older Jewish history from the 10th century to the 18th century in Bohemia and Moravia. Our last stop in the Jewish quarter is the Spanish synagogue. The exterior of the synagogue is really nice and it's done in the Moorish revival architecture. Interestingly enough about the synagogue, it has an organ in it, which is uncommon in synagogues. There are often concerts held here to showcase the organ and the acoustics of the interior. The synagogue itself is yet another extension of the Jewish Museum here in Prague. Well, let's head up to Castle Hill. It's an absolutely wonderful place to get terrific views of the city, but it is uphill, so I recommend that you take a tram up there. And then it's an easy walk back down. You can catch the tram at the National Theater and you can ride either 22 or you can ride the vintage tram 42. Either one of those will take you all the way up the hill. Both trams take a scenic route up the hill and go behind the castle. And there will be two stops, one at the Belvedere and another one right after that. If you want to walk through the gardens, then you get off at the Belvedere stop. Otherwise, wait for the second stop. From the second stop, it's an easy walk straight into the castle. We got off at the first stop and took a walk through the gardens. This was in September and the gardens were in really good shape and I do recommend that if you have the time to go ahead and walk through the gardens. After the gardens, you come across a scenic overlook which gives you a very good view of the back of the castle. Then you can cross the bridge into the castle itself. This is the top-down view, and you can see here where you enter the castle grounds. As I said, this is September, and we were surprised at the number of people we continued to see. The entrance is guarded by some very formal guards. This is the second of four courtyards here at the castle itself, and in the center is Cole's Fountain. This dates back to 1686 and once served as a source of water. From here we go through the archway, past the imperial stables, and stand right in front of St. Vitus Cathedral. Construction on the cathedral started in 1344, but it really didn't finish until 1929, which was the thousandth anniversary of the death of King Wenceslas. This is the largest church in the Czech Republic. Historically, the church was the coronation church for Czech kings and queens, and many Czech monarchs are buried here. The nave of the cathedral is really impressive. It's over 400 feet long and nearly 110 feet high. The ceiling consists of ribbed vaults, which is characteristic of Gothic cathedrals, but these were very innovative and influenced other cathedrals throughout Europe. This is the St. Sigismund Chapel, a 6th century martyr with beautiful stained glass that depicts scenes from his life. Here is another beautiful side chapel, which is the St. Anne Chapel, and is dedicated to the mother of the Virgin Mary, St. Anne. You absolutely must see the Chapel of St. Wenceslas. It's the most impressive part of the cathedral, and it's where you can find relics of the saint himself. The lower walls are encrusted with precious stones that tell the story of the Passion of Christ, while the upper walls depict the life and times of St. Wenceslas himself, and we'll talk more about him later. So we exit the cathedral into the third courtyard and turn around and look back at the church. Here we see the golden portal, which was the main entrance to the cathedral and was reserved for royalty. It has a mosaic called the Last Judgment, which dates back to the 14th century, and it's a rare example of medieval mosaic work. Then as we look up, we see Zygmunt's Tower, which houses the largest bell in the Czech Republic, and you can climb the tower by stairs. 
The rest of the square contains the requisite statue of St. George and some museums that you can go into if you wish. Well, the statue of St. George is there for a reason, for behind the cathedral is St. George's Basilica. Next door to the basilica is St. George's Convent, which has been transformed to an arm of the National Gallery and is also worth a visit. The basilica is one of the oldest and most significant buildings in the castle, and it was founded in 920. It features a flat wooden ceiling, minimal decoration that highlights its Romanesque origins. The altar is extremely simple, keeping with the theme of the church, and it's elevated, looking over the rest of the church. There are several side altars in the basilica that are dedicated to various saints, including St. Ludmila, who is the grandmother of St. Venceslaus. Next, we walk down past the Rosenberg Palace to a, well, a shopping area, shall we say, with lots of people and lots of shops and places to buy things and souvenirs. This wraps up our tour of the castle, so we retrace our steps to the first courtyard and go out in front of the palace itself. This is the main entrance to the castle, which is guarded by the famous Prague Castle Guards. They are a ceremonial unit responsible for guarding the residence of the Czech president. There is a changing of the guard every hour, but at noon there is a big production with a full troop and band, which you can see in the windows of the castle. Here is the front of the castle, and it offers spectacular views of the city. And because we took the tram up, we're going to walk back down, and it's a fairly easy walk. We walk over to the ramparts for a beautiful view of the city in the rampart gardens just below the walls. It's a really easy walk down, so you don't have to worry too much, and all the way down you just get these wonderful views. There is another way down, but it involves stairs, so I don't recommend taking those. But when you get to the bottom, you go down this very, very nice street with lots of cafes, lots of shops, and things to do along the way. And again, it's a gradual walk down the hill. On the way down, we went by a marionette store, and they sell marionettes and puppets, and go in to take a look at the wonderful display that they have. You may also encounter a shop selling Tridlo, which is a, well, really, it's the Czech version of a cinnamon roll, and it's on these spiral rolls roasted over an open flame. Well, we're done with Castle Hill, and we're going to head towards Charles Bridge, but before we do, we want to stop by the John Lennon Wall. The wall began as a tribute to John Lennon shortly after his assassination in 1980. It was a site for graffiti and artwork inspired by Lennon's message of peace. During the Soviet era, the wall became a symbol of resistance against the government. So, now it's off to the Charles Bridge, and it's an easy walk to the Charles Bridge from either the main square in the old city, or after you've come down from Castle Hill. The bridge was started in 1357 by Charles IV, and it was intended to connect the old city with Castle Hill. This is the best place in the city to get great photos of Castle Hill, as you can see. The bridge is extremely popular with tourists, and remember again, this was in September. All along the length of the bridge, there are three statues of saints which were originally installed in the 17th and 18th century. This is a statue of St. John the Baptist, and it's said that touching the statue brings good luck, and you can see how polished the brass is at the base of the statue. There are a couple legends that say eggs were mixed into the mortar to increase the strength, and that the bones of the dead were used to enhance its strength as well. I don't know why, but it seems there's always a caricature artist stationed somewhere in the high-traffic tourist areas. Another great way to see the bridge is take a river cruise on one of the many boats that travel up and down the river, and I'll mention that a little bit at the end. The Old Town Bridge Tower stands at the eastern edge of the bridge, it was constructed as part of the fortifications of Prague's Old Town and served as both a gateway and a defensive structure. As you go through the gate, turn around and take a look at the statues on the top of the tower, which includes King Charles IV himself. Just past the gate is St. Clement's Cathedral, and it's common to find performances of Vivaldi's Four Seasons in here. Next, we'll head off to St. Wenceslas Square and then visit a couple other locations on the way there.
It's not a very long walk from the main square, but we'll take a little detour past the Powder Gate. So from the main square, you just walk up Seletna Street, and that takes you to the Powder Gate. This is a great little walk if you want to get away from the hordes of people that are around the main square. We go first by the Estates Theater, which is a performing arts theater. It's been running continuously since 1783. It has opera, ballet, and other dramatic works. While we were there, the banner was advertising Cosi Fantute and the Marriage of Figaro. This is a really nice and peaceful walk because everybody's down at Charles Bridge or the main town square. But it's uh, got a lot of architecture and nice places to see. So we turn and see the Powdergate Tower, which was completed in 1475. It served as a gunpowder store and is still the starting point for the coronation or royal route to Prague Castle. Right next door to it is the Municipal House, which is yet another venue in the city for music, concerts, and drama. Okay, from the tower, it's a very short walk down to the end of Wenceslas Street, which is surrounded by some modern buildings, but it opens up into a great big pedestrian zone that is a great place to walk and even stop and have a bite to eat. At the other end of Wenceslas Street, we see the National Museum, which is a, just a great place to visit. Unfortunately, we didn't have time to get in, but we did have time to grab a bite to eat in this nice little outdoor cafe. So we sat down and had a beer and a bite to eat and just enjoyed watching the people go by. At the end of the square, we see the statue of St. Wenceslas, who was the patron saint of Bohemia. The square was a major site of mass demonstrations during the Velvet Revolution in 1989. The good King Wenceslas is best known from his Christmas carol, but actually St. Wenceslas Day is on September 28th, which is a Czech national holiday. Not far from Wenceslas Square is the Palace Lucerna, which is a wonderful shopping area and you should go into it. But even more so, there's a very interesting statue in there, and that's King Wenceslas himself sitting astride an upside-down horse by the sculptor David Cherney. This is somewhat controversial and subject to interpretation, however you wish. Well, this concludes our tour of Prague, but there's a couple other things I just want to mention before leaving, and that is there's a tram you can take out of the central square, which gives you a nice tour of the city. And secondly, you might want to look at some of the boat cruises that will give you yet another view of the Charles Bridge and you have a chance to get some food and drink. I do hope you enjoyed this tour and if you did, hit the subscribe button and you'll get notified when new videos are posted. Such is the one that gives you another look at Prague, this time at night.